Good morning, everyone. My name is Tawana. I'm the Special Events Coordinator for Green Thumb. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as folks are tuning in, I'll just put it in the chat. Um, welcome, and they can introduce themselves. So we're going to start off with Jason Stein from New York's Parks Stewardship Program, and I will hand over the mic to you, Jason. Thanks, Tawana, and special thanks to the whole Green Thumb team for uh, inviting me to join this. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so uh, I am the Advanced Volunteer Coordinator for Parks Stewardship, and specifically, I coordinate the Super Stewards Program. And this is a program that um, was actually originally born out of Million Trees Initiative, uh, as a way to um, train and empower advanced volunteers to be able to independently help care for natural resources uh, in New York City. So I'm really excited to be here today and specifically to um, talk to you all about um, ways you can maybe rethink um, your garden space and specifically rethink uh, like the borders of your garden space. So um, Parks Commissioner Silver has talked a lot about this idea of parks without borders. And I want to sort of think about, along with you, the idea of a, of a more porous border of your community garden, specifically vis-a-vis -vis the street trees around the community garden in ways that you can, one, steward your garden by helping the trees that are in the surrounding streetscape, the surrounding urban forest, but also how you can actually use those spaces um, for gardening as well. So... So just a quick thing about street trees, this, this map shows the increase in our total uh, urban canopy from the early days of the Million Trees Initiative around 2007. The spectrum of, of green, the darker green shows where there's been a gain um, in trees and orange shows where there's a loss. So you can see citywide uh, a really considerable um, uh, overall gain in the urban uh, canopy. We have um, just under 700,000 uh, just street trees alone. Um, now, one thing that we know about these street trees is that uh, they need a lot of love. Now, we've counted every street tree. I imagine there's some folks um, in, this, uh, in this presentation that probably joined some of our counting efforts. And when we counted our street trees, we didn't just count trees themselves. We also counted things like signs of stewardship. A sign of stewardship could be a lot of different things. It could be um, somebody's put mulch down. Somebody has put up a sign trying to keep dogs away, or somebody has, of course, been gardening in the tree bed. One thing that we found was that with all almost, you know, two thirds of a million trees, where there were four signs of stewardship, in every case, the tree was alive. We're talking about in all five boroughs, two thirds of a million trees. In every single case, they were alive. Now, when there were no signs of stewardship at all, that number dropped down to just over 70%. Now, yes, you could say correlation is not causation, but what we can see very clearly is that stewardship, especially stewardship of younger trees, a tree that's, let's say, small enough that you could wrap your hands around the trunk, um, has a major impact on the likelihood of that tree to survive. Why is that important for us? Not just because we love trees, but because what we, we love what trees do for people. Um, all kinds of ecosystem services from uh, cleaning pollution out of the air to cleaning our water before it enters our, our water bodies to reducing heat issues and all these kinds of, all these kinds of things. Um, what we know is that the bigger trees get, the longer they live, the more of these services that they're giving to our communities. So it's really, really incumbent upon us um, to find ways to steward these street trees. So that's where we come in with the Super Stewards Program. Um, I mentioned that we empower and train advanced independent stewards. Um, we have four like buckets or training tracks that we uh, train folks on. We have, um, and, and all of these have, the, have these specific names for the type of steward. We have our street tree care captains working on street trees, our natural areas volunteers, our navigators uh, working in forest areas. New York City has over 6,000 acres of forest area. We have our shorekeepers working in wetlands, um, helping us to maintain restored coastal wetland areas. And then we have uh, trail maintainers as a brand new program uh, in conjunction with the Natural Areas Conservancy, as well as the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, training a cohort of stewards to help monitor our um, over 100 miles of hiking trails in New York City. 
Of course, our focus today is on street trees and specifically um, offering you all in this presentation ways forward to think about your community garden work extending into the street trees around your garden in projects that might look something like what you see in these images here. Now this image is showing, this is a before and after in, uh, in one shot. This is uh, before the tree, this is the, the tree as we found it on the left side of the bed and the tree after we started it on the right. And this is uh, an example of us doing what we call the basic stewardship steps. Basic does not mean uh, you can identify this plant or you know the perfect thing to survive in a you know, partial slope in full shade or whatever. Basic in this context is could you do this work on a whim when the garden is closed in your pajamas you know, on a Tuesday morning with, a, with some tools that could fit in your pocket. That's what basic means in this context. And actually you can see the tools that we used by the volunteer's foot there, just very small hand tools, which are undoubtedly present in all of the gardens um, that you all are associated with. So basic steps are just cleaning out the waste, um, weeding and cultivating or aerating the soil. Now here's, a, here's another before and after stewarded tree where we've added an advanced step of mulching. I'll talk about what, what that means to us. But you can see really crazy weeds um, in this one that any of you eagle-eyed gardeners out there can identify, that's mugwort. So that's not just an eyesore competing against the tree, it's actually leaching phytotoxins into the soil to prevent that tree from growing. Um, we clean it out, we clean out the waste. And in this case, we add uh, a nice blanket of mulch. Now mulch is something that we consider one of our more um, advanced steps. Advanced in this context, again, not having to do with like skill, it has to do with uh, resources, um, with logistics. Advanced is a step that maybe you've been making phone calls and sending emails for weeks to try to coordinate something. Advanced uh, steps like this include something like watering, Watering is not particularly difficult, but try watering in New York City. You, you guys all know what, what I'm talking about. Folks in community gardens, thanks to Green Thumb, have a special, um, uh, a special capacity to potentially get into um, fire hydrants. Um, one of the things we want to encourage you is maybe you could use that resource when you're done in the garden to water some of the young street trees on the, sh on the streets around. Um, advanced steps include things like mulch. Mulch is really difficult to get. Um, in our team, we have one pickup truck for all five boroughs for 500 super stewards. It's something, but it's not much. Again, uh, your garden can potentially be a huge resource for being able to get mulch out into the surrounding streetscape. Many gardens actually have places where you can store a pile of mulch. Um, for our purposes, we, we almost can never drop a pile of mulch. We have to be physically present with a truck because we can't um, impede a right-of-way by dropping mulch on the sidewalk. So again, your garden can be this amazing hub for street tree work. Things like building tree guards uh, on the top left, that's a, that's a homemade DIY tree guard made by this amazing group up in the Bronx. And then of course we have something like tree signage. You see that really cool sign uh, on, the, on the upper right. Good project, by the way, that you could do with children, make um, children's art for like, hey, keep your dog out of my tree bed, laminate them, um, great project all around. But then of course, our main focus for today is this advanced step of curbside gardens. Can you turn your street tree bed into a curbside garden? The answer emphatically is yes. Do you need special permission from parks? No, go ahead. Um, we, we want you to. Um, now we want it for the beauty of course, but really what we want it for is what I call a wall of beauty. We know that these plants protect the tree um, in the sense that they are one, keeping out much more harmful plants like invasive species, but also even more critically, they seem to help deter uh, bad behavior by people you know, maybe not treating the, um, the tree as, as well as they could. So the main thing that I wanna to talk to you about in the next few minutes is just like, how could you start to consider um, tapping into your um, urban forest area as a potential gardening space? Now, it's a surprise to many people to hear that in New York City, you do not need special permission to garden in your tree bed, but there you go. 
Um, everyone has some neighbor who's going to come out and say, you're not allowed to do that. But, um, but you are very much allowed. And the proof of it is what you see in this slide. Um, there's official language on both the park's website that you see on the left, as well as the New York City street tree map um, that you see on the bottom right, um, that talks about how you can approach gardening in your tree bed, um, what the rules are. Um, there are a few, a few guidelines um, and also even recommendations, plant recommendations, um, both um, horticulture and um, native plants that I'll talk about in a second. Now I mentioned there are a few guidelines and those are pretty straightforward. One, and I feel like these are gonna be not surprising um, to you all, but one, no invasive species. We all know what that is all about. And then the second one is uh, in general, no woody species. So that might be like your rose bush, your boxwood, um, things like that. Now that second one is not as critical. Um, honestly, it depends on like the context of the tree. If you have a tree bed, that has a beautiful rose bush in it and the super of the building is watering it deeply all the time. That's great. That's, you know, ultimately what we care about is what's good for the tree. Our suggestion to avoid woody species is more of an issue of like, um, these are pretty competitive plants. So you can kind of think of it that way. The main thing is the no invasive species. Now, this is probably the most important slide in this whole presentation and it's, it's about tips or let's say you're in this position where you're ready to start gardening in your tree bed. Now there's a couple key things. Many people experience this problem where they have their plants, they're ready to go, and then they try to dig in the soil and it's too hard to plant in. So the solution they think is go to the store, buy a bunch of bags of soil and pile it on that and plant into that. But I'm telling you that is not a good way forward. That's actually, that can be actively harmful for the tree. If the soil is too hard to plant in, it's not that there's a lack of soil, it's that the existing soil is in poor condition. The soil structure has been destroyed by compaction due to vehicles, due to people's feet. And what needs to happen is better prep work, um, which you know ideally would be started before the, the planting itself to loosen up, decompact and aerate that soil. What happens if you add soil um, to a tree bed is you can really confuse the roots. Roots like to hang out pretty close to the soil surface. And when, if you've just adjusted that soil surface, you can like confuse the roots and specifically cause this situation where the roots start growing in a weird, unnatural circle. And over time, you may not see it happen. You may not know about it for 10 years, but what can happen is what you see in the picture on the bottom right, a girdling root. That's a death sentence for a tree. That's a slow death sentence for the tree. In this case, it was caused by the tree being buried by soil. This can also happen if you use too much mulch. Mulch is great, but you want to limit it to a couple inches because more than that, and you're going to cause these roots to be like, where's the, where's the ground surface? I don't know anymore. I'm just going to freak out and go searching for it. Additionally, you want to always make sure that the area near the tree is clear of any kind of soil or mulch. So you see in that green circle there on the left, that's the area that you probably want to avoid with your plants. We call it the critical root zone. There's more roots per bit of soil in there than anywhere else. So be extra cautious while you're digging around there. Um, and um, the other thing is that with any kind of, um, anything that you're putting in the bed, like mulch or compost, make sure that it's not touching the tree, physically touching any part of the bark of that tree. The image on the right, you see a tree that was buried in mulch. Um, I scooped it away and you see how wet and mucky that bark is and that's a baby tree. If that stays like that, that can, that can also cause a slow death for a tree. We, we see that all the time in the, in the tropical storm we had in August, a, um, a lot of the trees that came down had some kind of issue where they had been like mulched to death or had soil added or, or something like this. So these are some of the main takeaways in terms of like technical stuff with approaching your plantings. Now, of course, we want to avoid invasive species. You all know the, the principle, the right plant in the right place. Invasive species are exactly the opposite of that. Uh, this is an image of good old English ivy <laughs> in all of its, uh, I guess you can't call that glory. Um, the tree you can see with the yellow leaves, that's a ginkgo tree. All that green is English ivy. So that's, that's a tree slowly dying from this non-native plant that really shouldn't be there.
English ivy just you now planted in tree beds. Um, now I know some people on this call may bristle at this, but I'm telling you, forget about the morning glory. This is morning glory in all of its glory. They killed that poor tree under there. Um, and of course, morning glory is an annual, so that did it in one season. Um, so definitely reconsider what kind of plants you're putting in. This, is, this image is just showing this idea. If you have some of these plants, like there's woody species in there and you're like, well, Park said you're not supposed to have it. You don't need to rip it out. In this case, the super is doing great work um, keeping this watered. Again, we always wanna think ultimately what's good for the tree. Now, that being said, like in sort of running short of time, so I'm just gonna very quickly sort of like beat into your brains what I'm sure you've heard a hundred times already, but that is the moral obligation we all have to favor native plants where practical and possible. We could create together a world in which the weeds growing in the cracks of sidewalks are keeping monarch butterflies alive. Milkweed? Weed? Why is it a weed? It's actually critical to, to the earth's future. So if you can, it's, a much, it's often a much more difficult road to try to favor native plant gardens, basically create a native plant like wildflower meadow in your tree bed. Here's an example of that. This group that's been creating native plant corridor gardens. So what they do is they plant native plant gardens in like a series of trees in their neighborhood in order to allow pollinators to connect from the forest over here to the garden over there. And this is that this is one of their gardens in, in full summer and, and it's working. You see pollinators in these gardens. Um, just a quick, very quick thing. There's some other types of gardens, just so you all are aware of it. You may have heard of rain gardens or what we used to call bioswales. This is not necessarily in our purview yet because these are high, high engineered systems. So we don't necessarily want folks to be gardening in these ones just yet. You can know a rain garden um, based on the curb cut. So if you look at both of these images, you'll see that the curb is cut out. That's to allow water to intentionally flow in and flow into this like deep basin, which the, um, which the tree bed sits atop. Now, can you plant in an empty tree bed? Yes, definitely. The one caveat is that um, if that tree, if that bed is going to be planted, we can't necessarily tell you the exact planting date. The closest we could tell you is, oh, it's gonna be planted in the fall. So you would wanna know that in case you've like, let's say bought some plants with your own money and put them in there, you want time to dig them up. And you can look and you can find um, when the schedule of when your tree is slated in uh, for planting um, by checking out the New York City Tree Work Hub. If you were trying to request a new tree, you can do that. We really want you to do that, helping our eyes on the ground find planting locations um, in the streetscape for us by calling 311 or going online. Um, and basically, we're hoping that you can use this uh, knowledge and perspective for a couple of things. One, this is my shameless plug, you can become a super steward, part of our network, um, and get uh, basically training from us in uh, introductory arboriculture. You can become a citizen pruner with Trees New York, um, learn how to actually prune trees. And um, then of course you can turn your block party into a gardening party. Are you throwing a block party with your block association? Why not get the kids involved in some horticulture as well? You've got the trees for it. You've got the go ahead. And ultimately we're hoping that you can look at your community garden as a kind of command center for urban forestry efforts, a place where you can store tools, you can have meetups, you can potentially store mulch, get access to water, all these kinds of things. Um, when the next hurricane rolls in and threatens your garden, what's gonna be standing in its way? The, the trees on the streets around it. So if you love your garden and wanna protect it, um, it's worth your while to consider also stewarding um, the surrounding urban forest. And if you do so, um, we definitely encourage you guys report your work on the New York City Street Tree Map pictured here. You can also use this just to get cool info, like how much pollution does my tree actually take out of the air? Things like that. And just some additional resources um, for all of these things. Um, again, if you're interested in the Super Steward program, just check out NYC Parks Stewardship or, or Google Super Stewards. And I think that's it. Thank you, Jason. That was very interesting. Um, to learn about all the tree care. Um, so now we're gonna go to some questions and I have a question. 
Are tall plants like sunflowers allowed in tree beds? That's a great question. You know, it's it's not it's not that they're not allowed, and you know, sunflowers are not technically woody plants. Sunflowers are a little bit risky because um, they are a little bit more greedy for the nitrogen in the soil. So, depending on what your capacity is, it, personally, if I were putting sunflowers in. I'm not saying don't do it, but I would want to make more of an effort afterwards to maybe compost that tree at the end of the season to replenish some of the nutrients lost um, by that particularly aggressive species. Well, thank you. Um, someone wanted you to go back to the last screen for the oh, yeah, resources, yeah. but I will also post in the chat um, New York's Parks stewardship, stewardship program. Uh, stewardship program. And um, so they can have the link to that. Sorry about that. Um, are there any more questions? Um, you could just put them in the chat. And I also forgot to mention that we have a Spanish interpreter. Um, so if you click the link at the bottom of the Zoom page, you can go into the Spanish interpretation room. Um, I have another question. Um, some flowers aren't good to grow. Some flowers aren't good to grow. Not, it's, not necessarily, it's not necessarily that they aren't good to grow. Um, it's just that the really tall ones in particular use up a lot of the limited nutrients available. So um, if you're gonna grow them, I would suggest just planning to compost uh, and or mulch afterwards, just to try to replenish that, that soil a little bit. There are sunflowers that are um, much less aggressive. There are lots of native sunflower species that you might consider. Um, that's another shameless plug for native plants. But so you can look into something like that. So in general, it depends on like how much nutrients that particular plant um, is going to um, is going to take out of the limited soil that the tree has available to it. Thank you. And we have another question: Are there particular plant plants that can repel dogs? That's a that's another good question. Um, I think in terms of the scale of like how many dogs there are out on the street and you know the life of street trees, I'm not convinced that there are particular plants that can that can keep dogs away. Um, there are some plants that aren't good for dogs, but you know we wouldn't necessarily want um, want those in either getting a dog you know potentially poisoned, God forbid. Um, so the in terms of repelling dogs, the most effective thing we've found generally is like community support. It's specifically like the neighbor, the person walking their dog, like looking over their shoulder or being like, oh, I don't want like the neighbors to like think, you know, ill of me for, uh, for making this mess. Um, and that's why we encourage things like signage, um, which you can get creative with. You, like I was saying like a really effective one seems to be children's art for relatively uh, little money and resources. You could do a project with kids if you have that availability, like have them make some artwork about keeping dogs away from trees, laminate that, and then either um, tie it to a tree guard if there is or stake it in the ground. Um, that seems to be one of the more effective ways to keeping dogs away. Thank you, Jason. 